Join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we come to you as we quieten our hearts to listen to your word. May your word refresh us, strengthen us, and help us, Lord, to know your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, Lord, be pleasing unto you. My Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we want to continue on the series of Habakkuk. And uh, as uh, Deacon Bernard has shared, uh, uh, this is the third session. Uh, we have done this um, over three weeks. The past two weeks we've been talking about Habakkuk 1 and Habakkuk 2 last week. And today we are closing the series uh, on Habakkuk 3. Now let me just do a quick recap, right? I think we all need some uh, vision. Eh? So in Habakkuk, Habakkuk is actually the prophet, eh? a prophet of God and... As a prophet, he delivers God's word, eh, mainly telling the people uh, about what God wants them to do, and many times warning them uh, about the false ways. So in this book, um, it was unlike the other book uh, in, in the prophets. Eh? Um, what I mean is that in most prophetic book is that God is the one who speaks to the prophet, and prophet brings the word eh, to the people. But in Habakkuk, eh, it's different. The prophet Habakkuk was the one who was talking to God, right? And questioning God. And it's like a prayer. Um, the one in the prayer in Habakkuk did, in fact, most of the talking. And this prayer by Habakkuk came at a period prior to 597 BC and in the year uh, the Babylons uh, conquered Jerusalem. So it's before. 597. And when we know in history, when Babylon conquered Judah, it is a terrible time. A time of suffering eh, for the Jews. And in fact, I believe Habakkuk is one of those eh, prisoners of war. So what do we learn in Habakkuk so far in chapter 1? All right, In chapter 1, we learn that the prophet was crying out in anguish. Prayer, he was praying to God, not prayer of thanksgiving but protest and pain. And what was Habakkuk protesting? Habakkuk, in fact, had two complaints. All right? The first one is that he complained to God, God, why you permit evil? Habakkuk cannot understand. Okay? Habakkuk cannot understand how a holy God who is holy could permit wickedness eh, in Judah. And that's the question most of us are asking, isn't it? We ask God if you are so loving, why are there so many wicked people, wickedness in this world? Well, God did not give Habakkuk a direct answer, um, but God assures him all right, that yes, even though he'll use Babylon to punish Judah, he will ultimately punish the Babylonians. That's the first puzzle. And the second puzzle, of course, here, how can God use a pagan nation yeah, to punish Judah? And Habakkuk is puzzled yeah, uh, how a just God can use Babylon to judge Judah because in the eyes of Habakkuk, Judah is actually more righteous than Babylon. Uh, how could God use Babylon, a wicked nation, to come and punish us? So Habakkuk felt very unfair, okay? However, God explained that after using Babylon to judge Judah, he will. He will then punish Babylon. Answer to his anguished question. All these do not make sense, all right? Do not make any sense to Habakkuk so far. And in chapter 2, we learn uh, God responds to Habakkuk, watchful patience, and what does God say to Habakkuk in chapter 2? Does he promise that all trouble will disappear because Habakkuk, of prayers and of his patience? Um, not at all. God says, in effect, just three words eh, in summary. Be patient, persevere, and persist. That's what God answered Habakkuk. In other words, the trouble will not go away yet. All right? The word yet means 
it may be a long time. The problems linger, they may get worse, and this is the sobering message that God gave to Habakkuk. So in chapter 1 and 2, we see Habakkuk questioning God, God answered. So how will Habakkuk respond? All right. How is he going to respond to this sobering news? How did he change from parchment? That is the first sermon that we talk about to patience. Last week, Pastor Minte talked about it. And to ultimately praising God in chapter 3. And chapter 3 tells us how Habakkuk responded. Okay. So let's look at the chapter, uh, uh, not in detail, but let's look at it uh, firstly in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Now the first part of his response is found in verse 1 and 2, and he prays. He prays for God's mercy. And let me read to you verse 2. He says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive Revive it in the midst of the years. Make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Now you'll notice the first two words, eh? Oh Lord, is in, cap in capital eh? um, letters. And that is because in Hebrews, it is the name of God. And the name of God, Yahweh, uh, that's the name. Now Habakkuk was not talking to God in general. He was, in fact, talking to God in a very specific, by using God's personal name. The name that God revealed himself to Moses eh, in the burning bush. Now, addressing God personally, Habakkuk said, I've heard. Okay? I've heard the reports eh, about your works. So, in other words, what he's saying is, from young, maybe he attended Saturday school, Sunday school, he have heard the stories that happened when during the time eh, um, in the past when God um, helped the Israelites eh, to, to, to cross the Red Sea and all the stories that he heard of, I heard about you showing up, eh, that Habakkuk said, I heard about you saving the people in the land of Egypt. I wasn't there, Habakkuk said. I wasn't there to experience all those things. I heard those things. I know sometimes you show up in a big way to save the people, and his request is, God, I want you to do that again now. That is in Habakkuk time. Huh? He wants God. What you have done in the past, can you do it again? And that is his request. All right. So in other words, he's requesting God to do the same marvelous miracles huh, that God did huh, when he was delivering the people of Israel out of Egypt that he had done to his people in the past. He pleaded. He pleaded with God to have the same mercy and to work in a miracle in the midst of the current crisis. He prays, and he not only prays, he prays passionately. God, please, please do that again now. He is imploring God to do it again, for he longed to see God's wonders with his own eyes. Now, dear brothers and sisters, isn't that our prayer many times? We ask God to show himself. God, show yourself. Eh? We ask God to send fire to destroy the wicked people of the world. But I would say that be careful with such prayer. Because if God really answered the prayer, you might get burned. Who knows? Are you not the wicked one? Are you so sure you are not the wicked one? Yes, we desire to see God do something great eh? so that many people would turn to him. Yes, that's our prayer. And we can pray and we pray that God will do something great but I, I think we need to continue to know that God didn't answer Habakkuk. And I was warning you that God may not answer you. Eh? And the question is, so then, should we stop praying? Since God don't answer, should we stop praying? And should we stop praying for God to do something great? Of course, the answer is obviously not. Eh? 
We should pray even more. And let's see how did God respond. Or how did God, how did Habakkuk respond? How did God, Habakkuk pray? Eh? Did he stop praying? Did he stop asking God to not do marvelous work? He prayed. Eh? And let's see the end. Okay? In fact, I highlighted that at the end of verse 2, it says Habakkuk prayed in wrath. Remembered. Remember mercy. Now Habakkuk, right? Habakkuk knew the promise wrath, the word wrath, eh? meaning that the Babylonian, the Babylonian is going to invade. And the invasion is definite, cannot run away. It is clear. God is going to punish. In wrath, Habakkuk pray, show us mercy. He know that the invasion will come to Judah, and he pleaded with God to remember mercy. Despite the fact that God has set his mind to punish Judah, yet Habakkuk pleaded with God, please, show us mercy. Why he is able to pray in this manner? He could pray in this manner because he knew from the previous revelation that God's nature was always to be merciful, that God is full of compassion and abundant in his loving kindness. And Habakkuk prayed, eh? Passionately, remember? In fact, he prayed, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Renew your miracles in our day. Bring deliverance. Bring healing. Bring peace in our time. Even though he knows it's a definite thing, yet he continued to pray. Habakkuk did not hesitate to plead for God's miracles and mercies. Perhaps, Perhaps you should not be too hesitant either. Sometimes we are so worried to pray to God eh, for something. We are hesitant. Maybe some of us here, because of our physical sickness, we have some physical healing that we want God to perform, and we've been praying and praying. Or is there someone whom you've been praying for a long time for his or her salvation, yet the person has not responded yet? You've been praying for a long time. My answer to you is do not hesitate. Do not hesitate. Do not hesitate. Eh? Pray to the Lord for mercy. Pray for deliverance. Pray for healing. And that's what Habakkuk did. He prayed. He pleaded. For God's mercy. Now, secondly, as we move on to the few, next few verses, now in verses 3 to 5. Eh? Now, verses 3 to 5, Habakkuk proclaims the greatness of God. Now, there are a number of difficulties facing the translators, even the translators of Hebrew uh, text in these verses. However, all right, I will not go through the detail. However, most scholars eh, do, do not dispute the overall picture that is portrayed in this section, and that is God's majesty and power. Okay, so you have a long portion that talks so much. Eh? Uh, but basically, here he's talking about God's majesty and power. And most of us will find that Habakkuk's language that he used, eh, and an imaginary uh, language that he used here, are hard to understand. And I certainly concur with you, it's hard. And Habakkuk uses a lot of imagination and retelling of the story uh, in words and terms that he thought would be more convincing. So he actually added more things to the Exodus story. All right? Now let's look at firstly, verse 3 to 6 eh, in very brief. Eh? Now in verse 3 to 6, I just read some portion of it. You see, his splendor covered the heavens, eh? his brightness was like the light, raised fresh from his hand. He stood and shook the nation. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. He's the everlasting way. Now, if you read this version and you read Exodus, uh, in fact, it's very different. Uh, slightly different. Why? Because Habakkuk added more, all right? So that he may sound more convincing. So Habakkuk, in fact, is retelling right, the story of Mount Sinai. The thunder, the lightning, he 
you know, like watching movie you know, with all the special effects. Eh? So he added some more, okay? But in fact, here he's telling the story that happened at Mount Sinai. God appears to Moses eh, and Israel on the mountain, and the mountain thunders, lightning flashes, the strong wind in the skies. He used striking and terrifying language eh, to convey the awesome majesty of God's appearance at Mount Sinai. If you have watched the Ten Commandments movies, eh, so sometimes movie makers would like to make it more elaborate, eh, make it more exciting, so they add thunders, eh, sound. And again, in verses 8 to 15, eh, 8 to 15 here is again a lot of imaginative language. Let me just read a portion of it. Eh. It says, What's your anger against the seas when you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? You stripped from your bow, calling for many arrows. You trampled the sea with your horses. Here again, imaginative. Did God really do that? Here, what he basically described again is the victory. All right? The victory over the Egyptians at the Red Sea. Now, it's interesting to note that Habakkuk described God using arrows and chariots eh, to conquer the raging sea. Now, have you asked, why? Why did Habakkuk in chapter 3 started thinking about Exodus and Sinai at this point in time? Why? Why did Habakkuk bring in the story here in chapter 3? Why did he reaffirm God's greatness and God's grace at this point in the story? Now, the answer is obvious. Eh? It is needed. It is needed. Remember, Habakkuk was complaining. Habakkuk may be a little bit discouraged. He needs to reaffirm. Eh? Here, God is, is trying to reaffirm him. The answer why did he mentioned the story here is because he needed to remind his heart and his mind that God still loves him. Now, sometimes we, we need that. Eh? Sometimes we feel that things are not going our way. Sometimes we are so discouraged. We need to remind us again of what God has done in the past. And here, Habakkuk is doing the same thing. He's reminding himself, yes, God has done marvelous acts. God will do it again. He is trying to remind his heart and his mind that God still loves him. The Habakkuk still cannot understand why God allowed evil in this world. He never let himself forget. He reminds himself of the past. He recalls the love and the grace of the Heavenly Father. And as a result, doubts disappear. For he knows God still loves him and God is his Heavenly Father. And God is God. He is in control of all things. So dear brothers and sisters, when we struggle, we struggle to understand sometimes what God is doing in our lives. It can be helpful to consider the greatness of God and how he has worked in the lives of saints of old and show his faithfulness. Perhaps you are struggling with someone who dislikes you. Somebody, we know not everybody likes us. Maybe sometimes you struggle. Why people dislike me? Or you may be struggling because your spouse is openly critical of you. You struggle. Perhaps you have a lost a loved, a loved one recently or have been diagnosed with a fatal disease. We struggle with that. Perhaps you have been retrenched or lost out of an employment opportunity. It's because of your age and you're crying unfair or you are facing mistreatment eh, from not your family members, maybe the church member. Some mistreatment that you're receiving, even from church. Now I encourage you to rehearse. All right? Rehearse God's faithfulness to others in the Bible, in church history, in your own immediate family or friends that is close to you as a means to encourage yourself that God is great and faithful to his people. It may not remove the pain, all right? But it certainly will help you remember. Remember God's greatness and faithfulness in your pain. 
And that's what Habakkuk did. He remembered. He tried to recall. And he encouraged him. And I always enjoy the time eh, um, when brothers and sisters, when we gather eh, uh, during prayer meeting, uh, where we give time for members to share their thanksgiving, eh, to share their, prayer answer, their answered prayer, to share what God has done in our life. Eh. And it may just very simple sharing. An answered prayer or some struggles and difficulties that you're struggling and how God has led you. Now, when you share, all right, as a listener, it encouraged me. Okay? I'm always very encouraged right, when members share your testimony, uh, how God has been good to you, how God has led you, how God has been helping you in your struggle. Share. And every time I heard the sharing, it warmed, it warmed my heart. I'm very encouraged. And the strength, sharing strengthened my faith, in fact, that I am encouraged to see that God is alive. God is great. God is doing great in our community. And I also like to encourage cell group. All right, cell group. Yes, we gathered for Bible study. Yes, we gathered for prayer. But let's share. Share how you have been struggling, how God has been helping you, and this sort of sharing will not only help yourself, but it helps others. It helps others to remember that our God is great. And we want to continue to put our faith and our trust in our mighty God. Yes, Habakkuk proclaimed, right? He proclaimed God's greatness. And as a result, he was encouraged. All right? And what did Habakkuk do then? That's the last um, segment in chapter 3, verses 16. Okay? Habakkuk praises God eh, at all times. Now the book ends with Habakkuk praising God. Now let's look at the verses eh, in 17 and 18. It says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive failed, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no hurt in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy. In the God of my salvation. Habakkuk's words here, I think we need some translating eh, from those of us who are city dwellers, especially Singaporean. Eh. Um, those of us who are farmers will probably appreciate what Habakkuk is saying, but we are not. Eh. We are not farmers. We do not appreciate how serious Habakkuk's words eh, are. And as city dwellers, we probably wouldn't care whether a fig tree will blossom we won't lose sleep if we run out of grapes. Uh, when we need food, what do we do? We just walk into the shopping center. Every kind of food is there. If you cannot find fig, okay, never mind, I got grapes. You cannot find grapes, never mind, I got oranges, I got apples. No sheep, no lamb, no worry, don't worry. You still have chicken, you still have fish. We probably cannot understand how Habakkuk and those farmers went through. But most of the people in Habakkuk days, eh, they were farmers, right? They either manage vineyards, they grow grapes, they grow crops, own sheep and breed cattle. They didn't have big supermarket like what we have now. This was basically their livelihood, eh? breeding Reeling sheep, eh, bleeding sheep, raising, uh, growing crops. And in other words, when Habakkuk speaks of feet and grapes, he is actually speaking about fundamentals, basic living. Imagine an insurance agent eh, thinking, what if I can't sell a single policy this whole year? That kind of thinking. Or an accountant asking, what if I get retrenched? Or a family so breadwinner hearing the doctor say, I'm afraid. I have some bad news for you, Mr. So-and-so. Habakkuk imagines, eh? here, imagine the possibility of retrenchment, bankruptcy, homelessness, starvation, and even death. And that's how serious his words are. All right? Necessity, fundamentals. 
that is life, all right? Without all this, you don't talk about life. No food, no life. That's basically in Habakkuk's days. And Habakkuk, in fact, knew, and he actually painting here a picture of complete destruction of Judah, all right? When God has already revealed to him, yes, I'm going to destroy Judah, and here he's painting, yeah, without all this, nothing left. In fact, all disappear. What will he do? Now, was Habakkuk too morbid? or sometimes we call it too pessimistic. Why imagine the worst? How did he respond to the coming destruction of Judah? Well, in verse 16, we, we can see how he responded. Eh? Here, he was in complete shock. And he shook Habakkuk. And verse 16, he says, I hear. And hear from who? Probably from God. My body trembles. My legs, my, my lips quiver at the sound. And here, rottens enter into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. I believe this word that was spoken to Habakkuk, and when he spoke it, he is speaking with trembling lips. He probably saying, I, I, I hear, my body trembles. Trembling lips, shaking knees, and a heart pounding very hard. Why? Probably scared, fear. Why did God give Habakkuk a response that made him tremble? Dr. Gordon Wong, in his book, this book, God Why, where he did a short commentary on the book of Habakkuk, and he, he gave a very good reply. Eh? Why did God give Habakkuk a response that made him tremble? And this is what he said. Eh? Let, me, let me read to you. And he says this, For many people in our world, life just does not seem to work. No matter how hard we try to put our life together. And God wanted Habakkuk to feel this truth. His purpose was not to frighten, nor does he want us to be pessimistic. His purpose is to prepare us, to prepare us for life, today's world. We live in a world of uncertainty and terror, and God seeks to inspire us, to urge us to persevere, to help us come to the point where we've harbored and we, as well, would say the same thing. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive failed, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Yes. In the face of impending disasters, Habakkuk was able to respond in this manner. He praises God, he worships God, and he's singing loudly, I will rejoice in the Lord. That is his conviction. Despite all the destruction that's coming, everything will disappear. I will rejoice in the Lord. He worshiped the Lord. He praises God. Now, there are at least three things that we want to can learn from here, at least, when Habakkuk responded in worship and praise. Now, here we can see that worship, in worshiping God, here it deepens our faith. Habakkuk said in chapter 2, verse 4, he says, the righteous shall live by faith. So this is the faith that God found in Habakkuk. A faith that is personal enough to cry out in protest and complaint. But ultimately a faith that resolves to praise. To praise God even if the fig tree does not blossom. To praise God for better, for worse. For richer or for poorer in sickness and in health. To praise Him even when our questions find no answer. To praise Him even when we do not understand. Yes, worship. Praising God will deepen our faith. 
That's the first thing. Secondly, worship brings joy regardless of circumstances. Now, in verse 17 and 18, which you have read, eh, uh, here depleted and an economy that is in total shambles. No crops, no livestock, everything that many people believe provides security, satisfaction, happiness, all disappear. However, the prophets had joy because his joy was not from himself. His joy was in the Lord. Everything was gone. But he knows one thing. God is still here. Everything's gone. God is still here. Habakkuk was still safe. Eh? He could also rejoice because he was reminded that his only potent God would triumph in the end. And there was a better world coming. And that is the kind of faith that we need to have. Whatever that is happening, bad, maybe terrible, maybe suffering, it is not the end. Do remember, God is still with us. God is there to help us. And that is why he is able to shout out, I rejoice in the Lord. Thirdly, worship provides strength for living. Habakkuk strength and ours come from the sovereign God. Like a deer able to tread safely, he said, eh, upon the rocky cliffs without falling, Habakkuk, he felt very safe, very secure, all right? Nothing can shake him. Yes, God can enable you and me too. He will enable you. Trust in him, cry to him, ask him for this faith. The Lord will be your strength. So is it possible? Yes, I believe it's possible because by God's grace, by God's strength, it is possible. Nothing is impossible for God. It's possible. Now in closing, let me just, in short, eh? um, in closing, we have learned many lessons eh, from Habakkuk. But I hope there's one lesson from Habakkuk that we should not forget. And that is this sweetness in the spirit of Habakkuk. Eh? The sweetness. The Habakkuk's spirit. His prayer was not answered. His problems actually was not solved. And he may not understand everything. But because he knew his God and he put his trust completely in God. Yeah. I cannot understand. I do not know why things happen. But yet, he put his trust firmly on God himself. And he could say, yeah, I don't care what happened. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. His circumstances, all right, his circumstances caused him to shake, worried, fearful. But his relationship to God was absolutely unshakable. Okay, things around him all shake and all very, very terrible. But yet, he remained firmly, all right? His circumstances caused him to shake, but his relationship with God was absolutely unshakable. His faith in God is rock solid. And my prayer is that may we follow his example. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer in sickness. And even the fig tree does not blossom. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, please give us the faith to persevere. We pray not only for ourselves, we pray for our children as they grow up in this often cruel world of disappointment, suffering and pain. Grant them the strong faith to face these trials that will come their way. We pray this for our loved ones, our friends. Help us all to find the courage to triumph over the tribulations of life. As we cry, as we grieve, help us too to grieve not as those who have no hope, but as people of God who grieve with hope that there is certainty and this certainty of resurrection a new life beyond the cross of pain and suffering. By the power of our Lord Jesus Christ who suffered, died, and rose again, give us, Lord, give us the faith 
to face our fears and to praise God at all times. We ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.